Chapter 7 And at once the curious confusion of strong wind was upon them. Gusts howled about the corners of the shuttered houses and tore noisily across the open yards. Dust whirled with the rapidity as of some spectral white machinery. A tile came clattering down about their feet, while overhead the roofs had an air of shifting, toppling, bending. The entire village seemed scooped up and shaken, then dropped upon the earth again in tottering fashion. "'This way!' gasped the little pastor, blown sideways like a sail. "'Follow me closely!' Almost arm in arm at first, they hurried down the deserted street, past lampless windows and tight-fastened doors, and soon were beyond the cabaret in that open stretch between the village and the forest where the wind had unobstructed way. Far above them ran the fiery mountain ridge. They saw the glare reflected in the sky as the tempest first swept them all three together, then separated them in the same moment. They seemed to spin or whirl. It's far worse than I expected, shouted their guide. Here, give me your hand. Then found, once disentangled from his flapping cloak, that no one stood beside him. For each of them, it was a single fight to reach the shelter of the woods, where the actual ascent began. An instant, the pastor seemed to hesitate. He glanced back at the lighted window of La Cure across the fields, at the line of fire in the sky, at the figure disappearing in the blackness immediately ahead. "'Where's the boy?' he shouted. "'Don't let him get too far in front. Keep close. Wait till I come.' They staggered back against each other. "'Look how easily he slipped ahead already.' "'This howling wind!' Hendrick shouted as they advanced side by side pushing their shoulders against the storm. The rest of the sentence vanished into space. The son shoved him forward, pointing to where, some twenty yards in front, the figure of Lord Ernie, head down, was battling eagerly with the hurricane. Already he stood near to the shelter of the trees, waving his arms with energy towards the summits where the fire blazed. He was calling something at the top of his voice, urging them to hurry. His voice rushed down upon them with a pelt of wind. "'Don't let him get away from us!' bawled the song, holding his hands cupwise to his mouth. "'Keep him in reach! He may see, but he must not take part!' A blow full in the face that smote him like the flat of a great sword clapped the sentence short. "'That's your part! He won't obey me!' Hendricks heard it as they plunged across the wind-swept reach, panting, struggling, forcing their bodies sideways like two-legged crabs against the terrific force of the descending Joran. They reached the protection of the forest wall without further attempt at speech. Here there was sudden peace and silence, for the tall, dense trees received the tempest's impact like a cushion, stopping it. They paused a moment, to recover breath. But although the first exhaustion speedily passed, that original confusion of strong wind remained, in Hendrick's mind at least. For wind, violent enough to be battled with, has a scattering effect on thought and blows the very blood about. Something in him snapped its cables and blew out to sea. His breath drew in an impetuous quality from the tempest each time he filled his lungs. There was agitation in him that caused an odd exaggeration of the emotions. The boy, as they came up, leaped down from a boulder he had climbed. He opened his arms, making of his cloak a kind of sail that filled and flapped. At last, he cried impatient, almost vexed. I thought you were never coming. The wind blew me along. We shall be late. The tutor caught his arm with vigor. You keep by us, Ernest. Do you hear now? No rushing ahead like that. Lisan's the guide, not you. He even shook him, but as he did so, he was aware that he himself resisted something that he did not really want to resist, something that urged him forcibly, a little more, and he would yield to it with pleasure, with abandon, finally with recklessness. A reaction of panic fear ran over him. It was the wind, I tell you 
cried the boy, flinging himself free with a hint of insolence in his voice. For it's alive! I mean to see everything! The wind's our leader, and the fire's our guide! He made a movement to start on again. You'll obey me, thundered Hendricks, or else you'll go home. Do you understand? With exasperation, yet with uneasy delight, he noted the words Bindi made use of. It was in him that he might almost have uttered them himself. He stepped already into an entirely new world. Exhilaration caught him even now. Putting the brake on was mere pretense. He seized the lad by both shoulders and pushed him to the rear, then placed himself next so that Lisan moved in front and led the way. The procession started, diving into the comparative shelter of the forest. Don't let him pass you, he heard in rapid French. Guide him, that's all. The power's already in his blood. Keep yourself in hand as well, and follow me closely. The roar of the storm above them carried the words clean off the world. Here in the forest, they moved, it seemed, along the floor of an ocean whose surface raged with dreadful violence. Any moment, one or the other of them might be caught up to that surface and rolled off to destruction, for the procession was not one with itself. The darkness, the difficulty of hearing what each said, the feeling, too, that each climbed for himself, made everything seem at sixes and sevens. And the tutor, the secret exultation growing in his heart, denied the anxiety that kept at pace, and battled with his turbulent emotions, a divided personality. His power over the boy, he realized, was gravely weakened. A little time ago, they had seemed somehow equal. Now, however, a complete reversal of the relative positions had taken place. The boy was sure of himself, while Isan led at a steady mountaineer's pace on his wiry, short, bowed legs. Hendricks, a yard or two behind him, stumbled a good deal in the darkness. Lord Ernie, forever on his heels, eager to push past. But Bindi never stumbled. There was no flagging in his muscles. He moved so lightly and with so sure a tread that he almost seemed to dance, and often he stopped aside to leap a boulder or to run along a fallen trunk. Path there was none. Occasional gusts of wind rushed gustily down into these depths of forest where they moved, and now, from time to time, as they rose nearer to the line of fire on the ridge, an increasing glare lit up the knuckled roots or glimmered on the bramble thickets and heavy beds of moss. It was astonishing how the little pastor never missed his way. Periods of thick silence alternated with moments when the storm swept down through gullies among the trees, reverberating like thunder in the hollows. Slowly they advanced, buffeted, driven, pushed, the wildness of some Valpurgis night growing upon all three. In the tutor's mind, was the strange lift of increasing recklessness, the old proportion gone, the spiritual aspect of it troubling him to the point of sheer distress. He followed Lisan as blindly with his body as he followed this new Bindi eagerly with his mind. For this languid boy, now dancing to the tune of flooding life at his very heels, seemed magical in the true sense, energy created as by a wizard out of nothing. From lips that ordinarily sighed in listless boredom poured now a ceaseless stream of questions and ejaculations, ringing with enthusiasm. How long would it take to reach the fiery ridge? Why did they go so slowly? Would they arrive too late? Would their intrusion be welcomed or understood? Already one great change was effected, accepted by Hendricks too, that the role of mere spectator was impossible. The answers Hendricks gave, indeed, grew more and more encouraging and sympathetic. He, too, was impatient with their leader's crawling pace. Some elemental spell of wind and fire urged him towards the open ridge. The pull became irresistible. He despised the pastor's caution, denied his wisdom, wholly rejected now the spirit of compromise and prudence.
and once, as the hurricane brought down a flying burst of voices, he caught himself leaping upon a big gray boulder in their path. He leaped at the very moment that the boy behind him leaped, yet hardly realized that he did so. His feet danced without a conscious order from his brain. They met together on the rounded top, stumbled, clutched one another frantically, then slid, with waving arms and flying cloaks, down the slippery surface of damp moss, laughing wildly. Fool! cried Hendricks, saving himself. What in the world? You called! laughed Bindi, picking himself up and dropping back to his place in the rear again. It's the wind, not me. It's in our feet. Half the time you're shouting and jumping yourself. And it was a few minutes after this that Lord Ernie suddenly forged ahead. He slipped in front as silently as a shadow before a moving candle in a room, passing the tutor at a moment when his feet were entangled among roots and stones. He easily overtook the pastor and found himself in the lead. He never stumbled. There seemed steel springs in his legs. From Lisan, too breathless to interfere, came a cry of warning. Stop him! Take his hand! His tired voice instantly smothered by the roaring skies. He turned to catch Hendricks by the cloak. You see that? he shouted in alarm. For the love of God, don't lose sight of him. He must see, but not take part. Remember! And Hendricks yelled after the vanishing figure. Bindi, go slow! Go slow! Keep in touch with us! but he quickened his pace instantly, as though to overtake the boy. He passed his companion the same minute and was out of sight. "'I'll wait for you,' came the boy's shrill answer through the thinning trees, and a flare of light fell with it from the sky, for the final climb of a steep five hundred feet had now begun, and overhead the naked ridge ran east and west with its line of blazing fires, Boulders and rocky ground replaced the pines and spruces. But he'll never find the way, shouted Lisan, while a deep trumpeting roar of the storm beyond muffled the remainder of the sentence. Hendricks heard the next words close beside him from a clump of shadows. He was in touching distance of the excited boy. The fires and the singing guide me. Only a fool could miss the way. But you are a... He swallowed the unuttered word. A new, extraordinary respect was suddenly in him. That tall, virile figure, instinct with life, springing so cleverly through the choking darkness, guiding with decision and intelligence almost infallible, it was no fool that led them thus. He hurried after till his very sinews ached. His eyes, troubled and confused, strained through the trees to find him. But these same trees now fled past him in a torrent. Bindi! Bindi! he cried at the top of his voice, yet not with the imperious tone the situation called for. The sentence dropped into a lull of wind. Instead of command, there was entreaty, almost supplication, in it. Wait for me! I'm coming! We'll see the glorious thing together! And then suddenly the forest lay behind him with a belt of open pasture land in front below the actual ridge. He felt the first great draft of heat, as a line of furnaces burst their doors with a mighty roar and turned the sky into a blaze of golden daylight. There was a crackling as of musketry. The flare shot up and burned the air about him, and the voices of a multitude, as yet invisible, drove through it like projectiles on the wind. This was the first impression, wholesale and terrific, that met him as he paused an instant on the edge of the sheltering forest and looked forward. Lisan and Lord Ernie seemed to leave his mind, forgotten in this first attack of splendor, but forgotten, as it were, the first with contempt, the latter with an overwhelming regret. For the pastor's mistake in that instant seemed obvious. In half measures lay the fatal error, and in compromise the danger. Bindi all along had known the better way and followed it. The lukewarm was the worthless. Bindi, boy, where are you? I'm coming! 
and stepping onto the grassy strip of ground, soft to his feet, he met a wind that fell upon his body with a shower of blows from all directions at once, and beat him to his knees. He dropped, it seemed, into the cover of a sheltering rock, for there followed then a moment of sudden and delicious stillness, in which the wary muscles recovered themselves, and thought grew slightly steadier. Crouched thus close to the earth, he no longer offered a target to the hurricane's attack. He peered upwards, making a screen of his hands. The ridge, some fifty feet above him, he saw, ran in a generous platform along the mountain crest. It was wide and flat. Between the enormous fires of piled-up wood that stretched for half a mile, coiled a medley of dense smoke and tearing sparks. No human beings were visible, and yet he was aware of crowding life quite near. On hands and knees, crawling painfully, he then slowly retreated again into the shelter of the forest he had sought to leave. He stood up. The awful blaze was veiled by the roof of branches once more. But as he rose, seizing a sapling to steady himself by, two hands caught him with violence from behind, and a familiar voice came shouting against his ear. Lisan, panting, disheveled, and half-broken with the speed, stood beside him. The boy! Where is he? We're just in time! He roared the words to make them carry above the din. Hurry! Hurry! I'll follow my older legs! See, for the love of God, that he is not taken! I warned you! And for a second, as he heard, Hendricks caught at the vanished sense of responsibility again. He saw the face of the old Marquis watching him among the tree trunks. He heard his voice, amazed, reproachful, furious. It was criminal of you! Criminal! Where is the boy? Your boy! Again broke in the shout of the pastor with a slap of hurricane, as he staggered against the tutor, half collapsing and trying to point the direction. Watch him! Find him, for the love of heaven, before it's too late! Before they see him! The tutor's normal and responsible self dived out of sight again as he heard the cry of weakness and alarm. It seemed the wind got under him, lifting him bodily from his feet. He did not pause to think. Like a man midway in a whirling prize fight, he felt dazed but competent, only conscious of one thing, that he must hold out to the end, take part in all the splendid fighting, win. The lust of the arena, the pride of youth and battle, the impetuous recklessness of the charge in primitive war caught at his heart, brimming it with headlong courage. To play the game for all it might be worth seemed shouted everywhere about him, as the abandon of wind and fire rushed through him like a storm. He felt lifted above all possibility of little failure. The Marquis, with his conventional traditions, the Pastor, with his considerations of halfway safety, both vanished utterly. Safety, indeed, both for himself and for the boy in his charge, lay in unconditional surrender. This was no time for little thought-out actions. It was all or nothing. God bless the whirlwind and the fire, he shouted, opening wide his arms but his voice was inaudible amid the uproar, and the forward movement of his body remained at first only in the brain. He turned to push the old man aside, even to strike him down if necessary. Lukewarm yourself, and a coward, rose in his throat, yet found no utterance, for in that moment a tall, slim figure, swift as a shadow, steady as a hawk, shot hard across the open space between the forest and the ridge. In the direction of the blazing platform, it disappeared against a curtain of thick smoke, emerged for one second in a storm of light, then vanished finally behind a ruin of loose rocks. And Hendricks, his eyes wounded by heat and wind, his muscles paralyzed, understood that the boy deliberately invited capture. The multitude that hid behind the smoke and fire, feeding the blazing heaps with eager hands, had become aware of him, and presently would appear to claim him. They would take him to themselves. Already answering flares ran east and west along the desolate ridge. 
I'll join you. I'm coming. Wait for me. He tried to cry. The uproar smothered it.